This is a fan generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazoff.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazoff Gang. Tonight, suicide of the Russian liberals. With us this evening, Dr. Gary Saul Morrison, a Lawrence B. Dumas Professor of the Arts and Humanities at Northwestern University. He is an expert in Russian literature and author of many books, including Anna Karenina in Our Time. Dr. Morrison teaches Anna Karenina in a course that has enrolled 500 students, the largest Slavic language class offered in America. Dr. Morrison, what an honor to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. What a privilege. Dr. Morrison, you had an article published recently in the magazine First Things. It was titled Suicide of the Liberals. We've tweaked the title for our purposes here this evening, Suicide of the Russian Liberals. Yes, which is more accurate. What, what a profound, powerful piece. Dr. Morrison, one of your central themes is a strange political hypnosis that affected a certain milieu in Russian society in the second half of the 19th century with accelerating force in the early part of the 20th century reading, leading up to the Bolshevik Revolution. Dr. Morrison, let's begin with that. Tell us about this strange political hypnosis. <clears throat> well, Russian intellectual life at the time was dominated by the radical intelligentsia. And at this point, the intelligentsia had uh, engaged in massive terrorism, you know, killing people by the thousands, uh, throwing bombs into cafes, you know, filled <clears throat> with nails to kill as many people randomly as possible, throwing sulfuric acid in people's faces. Um, anyone who wore any sort of uniform, postal uniform, anything, was likely either to get maimed or killed. Uh, people didn't want to go to work um, if they were government employees. Banks were being robbed. Um, terrorism was random. You could blow up a train car. Uh, and educated society, primarily <clears throat> liberal educated society, I have in mind here, that was not revolutionary in, uh, in the sense that they were not bomb throwers or terrorists or violent, nevertheless spoke up for the um, revolutionaries. They defended them in the parliament. They uh, contributed money for them. They, gave them safe houses, you know, so for the revolutionaries to go to. The businessmen, the, the wealthy businessmen who the revolutionaries were pledged to expropriate and kill, and did eventually, um, contributed large sums of money to these revolutionaries. Um, because somehow, if you were a good person, you were on the left, or at least you wouldn't criticize them, pre preferably support them. You got, you know, social points for doing so. You felt good about yourself. That's why I call it suicide. Because, you know, to do it that way was to write your own death warrant. And it's, down, it's very doubtful that the Bolsheviks could have succeeded without so much support. They represented a minuscule portion of the population. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there were... Some of the other revolutionaries who were equally violent represented larger portions of the population, but still the whole intelligentsia was, a sm was relatively small in Russia, but they, with the support of you know, the liberals and the middle class and all the educated, um, their power was enormously magnified. The government was completely powerless to do anything you know, about them. So Dr. Morrison, absolutely. Uh... What a strange political hypnosis. And you write about, for instance, the Constitutional Democratic Party, the cadets. And they advocated democratic constitutional procedures. They didn't themselves engage in terrorism. But you write and document how they aided the terrorists in any way they could. Now, when the Bolsheviks gained control, we know that they started their terror, not that it had to start, but... Once they were in power, they began to liquidate members of all opposing parties, beginning with the cadets. And so, and you write your, also, 
This was no mystery that this would happen. The Bolsheviks were very clear what they would do when they would get into power. They were quite clear. I mean, the first, what they did immediately after seizing power was to declare the cadets, their phrase was outside the law. That meant anybody could go and kill a cadet. Mm. And two cadet leaders were immediately murdered because they were in the hospital, they were murdered in their hospital beds. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. So look, as you write about as well, in 1909, a great collection comes out, Landmarks, a collection of essays on the Russian intelligentsia. This became one of the most important documents of Russian thought. Uh, Bulgakov, Berdzayev all contributed to it. Now they critiqued and gave a criticism of the intelligentsia and liberal society didn't really appreciate it that much. Tell us about it. Yes, this was a <clears throat> collection by um, several highly distinguished um, intellectuals. You know, three of them were going to be, were former Marxists who would become top theologians. Uh, two of them were leaders of the Constitutional Democratic Party, but wanted the Constitutional Democratic Party to take a stand against the radical intelligentsia, not to apologize for terrorism. Um, and they wrote really brilliant essays that could stand for, or would be informative for people who knew nothing and cared nothing about the Russian context because their analyses of a certain kind of mindset that the intelligentsia had um, and which other intelligentsias um, may have. You know, you know the, the Russian word intelligentsia doesn't mean what it does in English. We get it from Russian where it was coined about 1860, but in Russia, it didn't mean educated people. And it certainly didn't mean people who think for themselves, almost the exact opposite. It meant people who I, whose prime identity was with other members of the intelligentsia and who shared um, an ideological way of thinking, always a radical ideology. They were always committed to some form of socialism or anarchism, always believed in revolution. Um, and were, you know, there were materialists and atheists. Most, for example, of the great Russian writers, no one would have thought of them as members of the intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. As they, in our use of the term, they'd obviously be members of the intelligentsia, but in the, the original Russian use, you know, Tolstoy, for example, no one would have thought of him. First of all, he believed in God. Second of all, he used his title count, which meant that he had loyalty outside other members of the intelligentsia, right? He was, uh, not only not a revolutionary, but opposed to violence. Mm. Um, he would not have been, no one would have thought of him, you know, that way. The, the idea of being, for example, a moderate or conservative um, member of the intelligence was practically a contradiction in terms. No matter how well educated you are, no matter how well, you know, how famous a writer you were, that, that you could be educated, but you were not a member of the intelligentsia. So these articles are about, mm the intelligentsia in that sense. And their point uh, more generally is that in any given society, you can have the educated may or may not form an intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. you know, some, you know, in England at the time, there was nothing like it. You know, English intellectuals identified with their profession, with their class, they weren't all revolutionaries. Um, you didn't have anything like that. But at some periods in some societies, you get something like the Russian situation. And then the essays describing that mindset in landmarks become relevant. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. And of course, the mindset took on a certain appearance that you uh, describe dirty fingernails, uh, you know, generally bad manners, unkept. But I want to talk about a fascinating example you brought up with Dostoevsky and his second wife, because women had to smoke if you were part of the intelligentsia. And so you tell a fascinating story when Dostoy how Dostoevsky met his second wife. Um, to the best of my memory, he had hired a typist for one of his novels, and he had offered, huh? A stenographer, yeah. A, a stenographer, and he offered her a cigarette, which she refused. And uh, tell that story, because he realized something from that. Yes, you know, he calls, the situation was he was desperate he had signed a contract with an unscrupulous publisher to deliver a novel by a certain date, but the publisher didn't want the novel 
the publisher wanted the forfeit provisions if he didn't deliver the novel, which were, you know, he'd have the right to publish anything Dostoevsky wrote for 10 years without payment. Well, it was a month before the deadline and Dostoevsky was nowhere near finishing the novel he was working on, which was Crime and Punishment. And uh, so one of his friends suggested, well, you know, there's this new science called stenography where, you know, you just can dictate a novel off the top of your head and a stenographer will write it down. And the Russian stenography school is graduating its first class. Why don't you ask them to send over their top student? So he did. And she shows up. Now, she knew very well who Dostoevsky was. He was already a famous writer. You know, her father had been reading um, her Dostoevsky's work since childhood. And, um, you know, meanwhile, Dostoevsky, in addition to, you know, having financial troubles, um, was interested in, you know, getting married again. And he was having trouble with that too, largely because he didn't want a traditional Russian woman, he wanted someone well-educated, you know, an independent. Uh, but those people were all revolutionaries who would hate him, right? Um, so now the stenographer comes in and, you know, he greets her, he sits down, he offers her a cigarette and she refuses. But every <laughs> radical had to smoke, it's simply at that time. You had to, it was, you know, he's shocked and he thinks to himself, if she doesn't smoke, <laughs> perhaps she believes in God. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> she did. Right. This is how he first, you know, realized. Amazing. You know, it, you know I, I come from a Russian background, and I'm more, I understand more now why my dad was so critical, maybe, of young women smoking. Um, Dr. Morrison, also very fascinating. You just alluded to it. I want to bring this up here. You write about something very interesting in terms of the intelligentsia, that many of the most influential intelligents, from Chernyshevsky to Joseph Stalin, many of them came from, from clerical families. They studied in seminaries. Now, Pyotr Struve, for instance, he wrote about this, and he wrote how the mentality here was kind of like a cruel parody of religion. He wrote that it, quote unquote, had the external features of religiosity without its content. So we have a background here of religion and yet no religion inside. Something seems a little bit blasphemous here. Well, it, it was <clears throat> in many respects a substitute religion. And it's not the only substitute religion um, that's ever been, you know, devised. You know, um, I like a comment that is usually attributed to the writer G.K. Chesterton, who said, <clears throat> the problem with atheists is not that they believe in nothing, but that they're likely to believe in anything. Mm -hmm. We're going to find some substitute. And, you know, in the 20th century, some became communists and some became Nazis, which were both, you know, substitute and, you know, substitute religions, ideologies that promised to save humanity or a favorite portion of it. Um, and purported to have all the answers. You could be absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. And that the people in it, their lives would be redeemed by their devotion to a great cause. Mm -hmm. Sort of like being a monk in you know, traditional church. And the reason that so many um, you know, members of the intelligentsia were um, either sons of priests, priests in the Russian church can marry, you know, unlike the Catholics, right? Um, and it was sometimes a family business, you know, a father would be a priest, a son would go to a seminary and become a priest. Um, you didn't have to, um, but those people, th those priests were poor, but they were literate. And all they needed to do was change their, you know, a kind of religious fanaticism, subtract God and you get political fanaticism. Instead of the apocalypse, you get, which plays a big role in the Russian church, you get the revolution. Instead of salvation, you know, in the usual Christian way, you get salvation by sacrificing yourself for the party. The party becomes the church, you see. Um, you, you know, 
you know, I don't know, I don't think there's any Christian society that's ever taken literally Jesus's comment that you should sacrifice father and mother and brother and sister to follow me. Mm. But the Bolsheviks did, mm. right? You'd be told when you, you know, party members were, were often told when they entered, now you have neither brother nor sister nor father nor mother, you have the party. And, you know, the idea that you could be expelled from the party was like, your life was ruined. It mm. wasn't just an organization you belonged to, it was the purpose of life, it was everything. And in that sense, it was like, a church, you see, um, and it's supposed to have all the answers. It couldn't be wrong. Um, so that, you know, the mindset of that, you know, naturally would come from a, a religious fanatic would be, um, good training for that, particularly if he was already poor and angry and, and resentful for being poor or, or in a lower social order. And that would fit Chernyshevsky, you know, who was the, the, basically the saint of the whole radical movement, Nicholas Chernyshevsky. And Stalin was not the, um, the son of a priest, but he did go to a Russian, he was trained in a Russian Orthodox cemetery, a seminary. Um, um, and there are many, many, many of these, you know, were, were you know, ex-seminarians to the point where, you know, the word seminarian to call somebody a seminarian, you know, Dostoevsky has a character who leaves her husband and runs off to the capital with a seminarian. If you're just reading in trans, you don't know what that means, but the word seminarian was, you know, the, the word could be used as a term of abuse, not for people who didn't like religion, but because it could be, you know, it was sort of like calling someone, I mean, when I was a student in England, someone like that would be called a bullshit, right? Yeah. You know, um, you know, someone who violated all the rules, who was a radical, who, you know, was personally, you know, obnoxious in his habits. Um, that's how much uh, the seminarians were associated with the radicals. Of course, these are all ex-seminarians. The ones who actually, you know, would finish and become priests would not become like that, right? Right. And so, Dr. Morrison, you, we see very much here, you crystallize that there's a battle, a conflict between the intelligentsia and Russia's greatest contributions to world culture, the literature, Tolstoy, Turgenev, Dostoevsky, Chekhov. And there's an anti-God disposition in the intelligentsia, and yet God is very much present with the Russian writers and everything that they're writing about. Let me ask this first. If Tolstoy and Turgenev, Dostoevsky, Chekhov had followed the political formula of the intelligentsia, they would never have produced their great works, right? Well, you know, no great work can be written according to formula, right? Mm -hmm. Here, you're going to write a work that's going to say this and this about this social group and this social group, and somebody's going to give a little speech here talking about, you know, the latest communist or whatever it is, ideology. You know, that's what Soviet socialist realism was like, and it's all terrible. It's unreadable. Mm -hmm. um, you need creative freedom, and you need a sense that the world doesn't fit a formula, that the world is complex, and you need wisdom and insight, and that's what you get out of the great Russian novels. They were incredibly psychologically rich. Um, they realize that moral questions are incredibly complex and they explore them. That psychology is, you know, and human needs are not simple the way, you know, the revolutionaries or the materialists thought they were. Um, you know, and it's the depth of understanding of people and morals and the complexity mm -hmm. of the world, which is the exact opposite of the intelligentsia. If you see things as complex that way, you don't think you have all the answers. You're not certain because you can't be. And that, right. you know, my favorite line from the Landmarks Anthology is um, by um, the literary critic uh, Mikhail Gershenson, who says at one point, the surest gauge of the greatness of a Russian writer is the extent of his hatred for the intelligentsia. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. you know? And if you're thinking of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Chekhov as the greatest Russian writers, it's completely true. I mean, they mm -hmm. absolutely despise the intelligentsia. And, you know, 
it's not hard to pick out comments either from their their fiction or their letters. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know about the intolerance the of the intelligentsia for any view that isn't you know exactly right. You know. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. And look, within that belief system of the intelligentsia, definitely the excuse for destruction, for violence. And we see the war on empathy. There is the negation of empathy, the war on empathy, because if you have empathy, the revolution might not be that successful. You talk a lot about and you show that empathy is one of the foundations. It, it, it's just saturated throughout literature and especially Russian literature. Tell us a little bit about the intelligentsia's war on empathy and the Russian writers is, they're all about empathy and, and being interested in literature in and of itself nurtures empathy within us. Yeah, I mean, if you you know, what the Russians are best at, what they did the best of anybody in the world was, you know, the realist novel, right? The great, that, that's what the Russians were superb at. And particularly the, the philosophical realist novel, the novel of ideas. And if you think about how novels work, and not just Russian novels, think about, you know, the novels of Jane Austen or George Eliot um, or Anthony Trollope or Henry James, you, get inside the heads of the characters. The, the author takes you inside the head. You watch the heroine's thoughts develop as she talks to herself. It, you know, you watch her inner dialogue, you listen to them over hundreds and hundreds of pages and you identify with the character. That's why when you know, the heroine does something self-destructive, you, you wince, no, don't do that! Because you so identified with the character. This is practice and empathy. Yeah, and you say that very much with Anna Karenina, where you feel, and you talk about that in your interviews, where don't do that, Anna. Yeah, I always have that, that feeling, you know, don't be so self-destructive, Anna. You don't have, you don't have to, you know. Uh, we all, I think most people feel that. And, but that's, a, if you were completely outside, you wouldn't feel that, right? Mm. If, if you just, you know, looked at Anna, I don't know, the way some political radical would be and say, oh, well, she's nothing but, a, you know, an upper-class noblewoman. Who cares if she drops dead, <laughs> you know? That, right. that might be an ideological approach, but it's not the approach you get from reading any great novelist. They take you in, even if the novelist doesn't like the hero or heroine, disapproves, right. Tolstoy disapproves of Anna, but he makes you empathize with her, identify with her anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and the realist novel is, gives you practice. It doesn't just tell you empathize, it gives you practice in it. It poses a tremendous threat to totalitarianism, correct? Yes. Um, you know, the ones who really were um, vehemently against empathy and compassion thought they were really genuinely bad things that had to be rooted out with the Bolsheviks. Not all the radicals would have gone that far, um, but the Bolsheviks certainly did. And, you know, the, they would teach in schools that, you know, we teach people, um, learn how to be compassionate, learn to be empathetic, learn to have pity for the, you know, people who are, others who are suffering. The Bolsheviks taught children not to do that because the only, if, if you have compassion for someone just as a human being, what if they're a class enemy? You won't kill them. <laughs> That's right. You won't kill their children. And Dr. Morrison, is that why you talk about the, these battles? Trotsky versus Tolstoy, Lenin versus Dostoevsky, Bakunin versus Chekhov. And of course, I don't mean physical battles that occurred, but metaphorically, it's Trotsky versus Tolstoy, right? Yes, I mean, you know, Trotsky made no bones any more than Lenin did. That, um, well, there's a famous quote from Trotsky, um, you know, justifying random terrorism, which was the Bolshevik policy to terrorize the population. I mean, we had, you know, we don't accept the bourgeois theory of, quote, the sanctity of human life. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. They laughed at it. They had contempt for it. The way they had contempt for liberal tolerance. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, 
that Lenin's word for that was, quote, moralizing vomit. <laughs> right. And, and Dr. Morrison, in contrast to that, you talk about how for Tolstoy, it was not the big things in life. It was the little, little moments of consciousness. It was the littlest choices. It was the littlest things in ourselves, in our minds, in our souls that matter, right? Yes, that, that's, you know, the radicals believed in the grand gesture, the dramatic act, mm -hmm. the revolutionary act, the terrorist act. The, the, the great Russian writers explored the opposite view, that what makes life good or bad are the hundred thousand small things that happen every day. Mm -hmm. You know, the tiniest m m habits that you have, the smallest movements of consciousness, the way second by second you choose to pay attention or where to direct your attention or to look at somebody else charitably or hostily. Um, it's the sum total of ordinary events that even determines what you're going to do at, at dramatic moments. Life is not about fundamentally the dramatic and the big. It's about the small. And that's why Tolstoy you know, so emphasizes you read his novels, nobody did this better. The tiniest movements of consciousness that makes mm -hmm. a thought what it is, makes a person what she is. And if, and if it makes a person who he or she is, it means that the human being matters, which is a great threat to the Bolsheviks, correct? Yeah, I mean, the, remember that, you know, for the Bolsheviks, the individual, Mm -hmm. didn't matter at all. What mattered, in some sense, individuals weren't, weren't even real. What was real was social classes. Mm -hmm. you know, um, history was made by social classes, and since the revolution by the representative of the working class, which was the party, and those were the real things, those abstract historical forces. Um, you know, didn't matter how many you know individuals suffered or were killed. That's not what the world was about, right? Um, and that, that's fundamental. You know, we have a natural way of thinking. Well, you know, society is simply the individuals that compose it, the sum total of the individuals, right? Mm -hmm. But the Bolsheviks mm -hmm. thought that was a ridiculous notion. The individuals come and go. The party remains. You see, the, the working class remains. And with that Bolshevik ideology, a killing machine starts. And the killing machine, as we know, takes on a life of its own. The Bolsheviks, Mao's Cultural Revolution, Pol Pot, Castro, what have you. And, and so this killing machine begins to take on a life of its own. And you write about a certain mentality, among some, that, ah, oh, the pendulum is bound to swing back. There's this kind of notion that, ah, oh, the pendulum will bound to swing back. And you talk about that as this is in part some people's excuse not to take action. Tell us a little bit about this pendulum. And you talk about that if nobody gets up and stops what's happening, it's going to keep on going. Yeah, you, you, you get this uh, or some version of this comment, <clears throat> you know, in every revolutionary situation. There'll be people who say, oh, you know, the pendulum goes this way and the pendulum swings back. And so we don't really have to do anything. It'll happen on its own, is the idea. Don't worry so much. But sometimes, but the dynamic of a revolutionary situation is different. Mm -hmm. It's not a pendulum. It's like a snowball going downhill and picking up speed. And unless you stop it, it, it continues and gets, mm -hmm. right? It, in the revolutionary situation, the revolutionaries go as far as they can, mass mm -hmm. killing, torture, anything, until they're stopped. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, Stalin made this quite explicit. He spoke, you'd think that after the revolution, when there was nobody to oppose the Bolsheviks, they could stop killing, right? They wouldn't need to, they had no enemies. Stalin proclaimed the intensification of the class struggle after the revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you say, what sense is that? It makes sense when you realize that the mentality is you push it as far as you can, unless stopped. That's the opposite of the pendulum. Right. And as you write, quote, 
what meets no resistance does not stop. In a revolutionary situation. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. And look, what, what incredible prophecies we had in some of these Russian writers. Dostoevsky in Crime and Punishment, in the figure of Raskolnikov, in The Possessed with Pyotr Stepanovich. Um, we see a prophetic vision of Dostoevsky in terms of what the intelligentsia will produce in terms of terror. Can you tell us a little bit about Dostoevsky's prophecies in his novels? Well, the one that people always talk about is um, the possessed or um, the demons. Uh, the demons are the, the revolutionaries who play a large role in the novel. About half the novel is about a political conspiracy based on a real political uh, conspiracy, a real terrorist that actually um, had taken place in Russia and Dostoevsky attended some of the trials. Um, and he saw rather more deeply into it. So he had the revolutionaries talk about their plans, what they would do when they seized power, what their fundamental ideals were and how they would put them into practice. And the absolutely astonishing thing is, you know, it is, I, I'm amazed every time I still read it. Things that seemed absolutely crazy at the time. We're, you know, we're going to kill a hundred million people. They, you know, that's the, you know, the conventional low range figure for what communist regimes did in the many countries that they took over, not just Russia, but all of them. Right? Um, uh, they are going to, you know, um, some of the things that the Khmer Rouge did or the Chinese Cultural Revolution are outlined there. Um, then it all, didn't all happen in Russia, but they happened all somewhere, given these ideologies, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, how did he know? Nobody else in the 19th century knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, I, you can't find anyone else who, the conventional view at the time was, look, things are getting, we're making more and more progress. Um, we're, poverty is lessening. We're getting more and more liberal values and tolerance and democracy. And the 20th century will be still more of that. Right. Well, maybe in England, you know, maybe in Sweden, I suppose. But in a large number of places, it will be the exact opposite, he said. <clears throat> and, and Dr. Morrison, and you point this out. So there's something very different about Russian literature and Russian writers. In many respects, they're doing the work for philosophers, right? Um, you know, there isn't much um, academic philosophy that's worth anything, never has been in, you know, in Russia. When people want to ask deep philosophical questions, mm -hmm. they do it either through literature or literary criticism. Um, so if you have a, a really important thing to say about language, let's say, the philosophy of language, you might write a book as the best as someone in the 20th century did um, about how Dostoevsky uses language and what you can understand about language by how he uses it. Literature plays this enormously important role. Um, you know, uh, I sometimes like to tell, you know, my students that, you know, everywhere else people think, well, literature exists in order to describe life. Russians, yes, but it's also the case, you get Russians who basically speak as if life exists so that there's material for literature. And so therefore, something that you mention a lot, quite a thing that Dostoevsky, when Tolstoy's uh, Anna Karenina was being serialized, he said, finally, we have the justification for the Russian people. I mean, this is just an incredible thing to say. Can you imagine an American saying, you know, of some novel, you know, at last the existence of the American people is justified? First of all, Americans don't think life needs to be justified. Russians do. But if they did, you know, it probably would they'd be more likely to pick the iPhone than a novel or some piece of technology, right? Um, 
you know, but literature plays this role in Russia. The only thing I can, you know, ever been able to compare it to is if you, if you go back to the ancient Hebrews when they were still adding books to the Bible, when the canon was still open. That's what Russian literature basically is. It's right. sacred writing like the Bible was to the Hebrews, you see. <clears throat> and for Russians, therefore, life is kind of modeled on their literature. You know, you, you mention, you know, maybe in America or France somewhere, somebody says something about a writer and somebody will say, oh, okay, you don't like, like that writer or whatever. But in Russia, if someone were to say something bad about Pushkin, in many ways, it's, it's a violation of something sacred. It's almost looked on, upon as blasphemy in a way. Yeah, you'll hear, I've heard the term blasphemy. I've heard, you know, I, I, I had a friend who um, wrote an essay many years ago um, being rather critical towards the heroine of Pushkin's novel and verse, Eugene Onegin, Tatiana, mm -hmm. who is, you know, a saint as far as, you know, like Pushkin, you don't criticize Pushkin, you don't criticize Tatiana. And she evoked rage among Russians, you know, uh, for doing that, you know. And they called it blasphemy, like she had insulted the Russian soul, you know. You yeah. know I don't know. Worse than burning the flag, I suspect. You know? Right. And, and Dr. Morrison, you know, I'm so grateful to my dad and mom. We come from a Russian background. And... They nurtured that reading with us, you know, and we talked about the inner world that's created. But as you show, it's not just an inner world. There's some kind of Garden of Eden or paradise that we kind of go to when we're reading these works. In some ways, it's our homeland. And you write about the writer, you talk about also the writer Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Korolenko, who was half Ukrainian. And he was asked what his nationality was. And his answer really provokes tears in me. Can, can you mention that? Yeah, he replied, um, my homeland is Russian literature. And by the way, you get an almost identical comment made very recently by um, Russia's most recent Nobel Prize winner, uh, Svetlana Alexievich, who is um, part Ukrainian and part yellow Russian, but said that her identity is Russian literature, the great tradition of Russian literature. Right. So in her case, it's not even, no part of her is actually Russian, but you know, uh, but it's Russian literature. You know, she spoke Russian and she was part of Russia and that's her identity, you know. So Dr. Morrison, if, if literature, Russian literature provides an identity, a homeland, a place where people go that's a tremendous threat to a totalitarian regime that wants you on your knees worshiping it, right? Yes, it's really interesting. Um, a few people have commented. Um, there was a book I really um, read just a few years ago uh, developing this thesis that the Bolsheviks thought, well, we'll preserve Russian literature and give it, yes, of course, these weren't Marxists, but we'll give all the great classics of Marxist interpretation, that'll be fine. And we'll teach the great classics for Russian national pride, right? And in fact, the values that these books were conveying, mm -hmm. you didn't have to speak them, just the fact you're identifying with people, you know, the values of reading. You can't read Chekhov without understanding the value of compassion and empathy. The exact opposite of what the, they were learning in school from, you know, from the Bolsheviks. So in effect, the great, literature, Russian literature undermined slowly, gradually, beneath the surface, um, the Soviet project with a complete with persuasive and very different set of moral values. Right. And look, I'd like to conclude in this way. Dostoevsky, in many respects, gave a prophecy of what the intelligentsia would produce what, you know, what would come from the socialist impulse as well. And then we had the writers that endured the project that socialism built. And out of all of that came Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Varlam Shalamov. Could we end on that? 
your thoughts, I mean, I know this would take three hours, but just these two giants, and yet they also had a... Third, Vasily Grossman, you know, who wrote mm -hmm. Life and Faith, mm -hmm. the three of them together. They really, all three of them, deeply understood um, uh -huh. uh, the moral questions raised by extreme situations. Um, you know, what you get, both Grossman and Solzhenitsyn um, explore in, in detail the moral equivalence of the Nazis and the Soviets. Mm -hmm. uh, Shalamov and Solzhenitsyn are both describe people in the most extreme conceivable situation and how they react morally. Um, so you, I, I bring the three of these together, you know, they're okay. all magnificent writers. I mean, uh -huh. it's hard to pick which is, is better simply as a writer. Um, and they all have a, you can read any of them and get a really deep understanding of what totalitarianism is. Dr. Morrison, did Soviet communism succeed in wiping out Russian literature? What, what is the state of Russian literature today in comparison to the great giants? Well, there's nobody like, you know, of that stature. Um, uh, you know, You know, when the, the Bolsheviks took over, they executed writers and they exiled a lot of writers. And the ones who stayed had to accommodate themselves, you know, to the, um, the party line and couldn't write the really great works. The best works of Soviet literature were written, as they say, for the drawer. Um, couldn't be published in the, in the author's lifetime. You know, Grossman was told that his novel, Life and Fate, would, could not be published for 200 years. Mm -hmm. um, he managed to smuggle it out, which is how some of it got published, right? Um, right. You know, uh, the great novel, The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, he just wrote it for the drawer. He never, and he never even tried to get it published. It was inconceivable. But, um, and it's one of the, the great masterpieces of the world in the 20th century. Um, it's hard to think of, I, I can't think of any official writer you know, since, you know, the Stalinist consolidation that um, remotely measures up. I mean, even by a long shot to, the, to these writers, and they're not as good as Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Dr. Morrison, as we depart now, what would be your uh, final message, concluding words on the suicide of the Russian liberals? And I think our viewers now understand a little bit why I would also ask you to conclude after that, the suicide of the Russian liberals and why everybody should still be reading Anna Karenina. Well, you read Anna Karenina because you learn more about human nature and the complexity of moral questions than I think you probably will anywhere else, and I don't, whether philosophy or literature or anywhere else in the world. Um, the word for the liberals is, well, things, Liberals being nice, moderate folk don't realize how bad things can really get. And if they do think of it, they think it all comes from those people on the right, but it comes from both sides. Mm. Um, fanatics can be anywhere. Revolutionaries willing to push things to the extreme can believe in almost anything. You know, um, <clears throat> you know what the concept of nation or race was to the Nazis, social class was to the Bolsheviks. You know, you were born into it, that's what you were. It wasn't a matter of choice, right? It wasn't your occupation you chose, it was what you were born into. Uh, and you'd be exterminated for the wrong class. Any extreme ideology willing to do that is dangerous. And, you know, if we can't rely on the liberals in different situations to stand up to that, then we'll fall prey to it. Dr. Morrison, we have so many people on the edge of their seat right now watching. Before we go, they want to learn more about you. They want to follow you, read what you have to say. Where can people find you? Uh, well, I've written lots of books, which I'm sure you can you know, find on um, Amazon. Um, you know, I think there are uh, articles and different publications from the New Review of Books to the New Criterion. Or new Criterion, yeah. Right. Um, and you know, if you um, if you Google me, you'll find. I guess you'll find various things. I don't do that a whole lot, but um, 
Or they can come take a course at Northwestern University. I would be delighted. Okay. Uh, Dr. Morrison, I just want to say it's just been so moving for me for many reasons. Uh, doing my research, doing some homework, following you, uh, and, and getting ready for this interview. You know, I think that anybody that's dedicated their lives to Russian literature and to all these beautiful ideas and concepts and works, there's something very beautiful inside that person as well. And just, it was a great honor to have you here, and thank you for everything that you have done and continue to do. Thank you so much. And you know, I remember when Russian literature seized me by the throat and said, this is what you're going to do, you know. Um, I didn't have the advantage that you did, you know, growing up in a Russian, right. a Russian speaking household, but. But we are related, we are related because if I'm from a Russian background and your homeland is Russian literature, then we're related somehow, right? I, I think so, yeah. Okay. Doc, Dr. Gary, so huh, pardon? Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Gary Saul Morrison, what an honor to have you here. And we hope thank you. We, thank you. It was a real pleasure. Dr. Gary Saul Morrison, ladies and gentlemen, look him up, read his works. And if you haven't read it, start reading Anna Karenina. And we'll see you soon on the Glass Off Gang. Good night.